Hey, good evening everyone. Uh, we're going to go over discussion board week seven and for this week we're going to discuss standard operating procedures. Um, me personally, um, in standard procedures, one thing that sticks out to me is the pre-flight checklist. Um, this step is um, critical. So whether you're flying, um, you know, a Cessna 172 um, or flying a, you know, a King Air uh, or Lear, no matter what the aircraft is, um, each aircraft has a um, checklist for all of the procedures and they need to be followed. And to me, um, pre-flight means anything before the takeoff roll. So, um, you know, we're going to start pre-flight when we're approaching the aircraft. We're looking around for flat tires, cracks, um, pop rivets, anything like that. Uh, thorough pre-flight is very critical to ensure that, you know, we don't have any accidents um, and we can eliminate that factor. Uh, it's something that's really easy for us to avoid accidents of if we do a very thorough pre-flight. Um, quick story, I found a uh, wrench in a 172 that I was flying um, because of doing a very thorough pre-flight. Um, a lot of people don't look down in the cowling uh, when they do a pre-flight. But if, you, if you're looking down in there, if you've got a flashlight with you, take the dipstick out, check the oil, look around. Uh, the AMP that had changed the oil on the aircraft left his wrench inside on the oil cooler and actually um, caused a pretty substantial leak. Um, we were able to find that before we actually took off in the aircraft that day. Um, and it was a pretty large wrench. So um, if you know a thorough pre-flight had not been done, that could have been missed. You know and only knows what could have happened with that. So, um, you know, pre-flight for me is probably one of the most critical parts of standing operating procedures. The accident that I'm gonna discuss um, talks, you know, specifically about that. And you can see the NTSB report here. Uh, there's also a link to it in the reference. You can read the whole report yourself. I'm gonna to touch on the high topics of the report. So the NTSB determined that the pilots failed to perform a proper pre-flight. Well, what does that mean? They didn't actually say a proper pre-flight. They said that they failed to do a control check, which to me is part of your pre-flight. Um, you're gonna make sure that your controls are free and correct um, before you're anywhere near your takeoff roll. You know, that's right on your checklist to do um, with the engine startup checklist most of the time. So they, failed to release a gust lock switch, which is pretty much like a control lock to lock all the um, you know, control surfaces of the aircraft to keep them from moving around in the wind to cause damage to the aircraft. This should have been taken off on the startup procedure checklist. Um, all of the flight data and the CVR, there was no checklist done um, prior to takeoff, prior to taxi. Uh, I believe complacency was an issue with this because the NTSB noted that 98% out of, out of 175 takeoffs, 98% of the time there were no uh, checklists done for this item. And I think the pilots uh, just got very complacent, got you know, extremely comfortable with flying the aircraft, and they felt like they didn't need to do a checklist. Well, unfortunately, uh, this time it got the best of them and it led to a crash with total loss of life. Um, he started his takeoff roll and uh, immediately he could not get the throttles to engage properly. So he used auto throttle to try to get the throttles to engage. Um, immediately right there, he should have um, rejected the takeoff and aborted the takeoff, stopped it right there at the first sign of a problem instead of using the auto throttle to try to compensate. Um, and also he was unable to stop the aircraft in time. They did discover that the gust lock was on. They called it a steer lock. They were unable to disengage it probably because of the, uh, all the forces that were being exerted over the control surfaces. Uh, they did try to pull a hydraulic switch to relieve the pressure. It was too late and the aircraft ended up uh, going over the end of the runway and colliding as you can see down here in the picture. Um, and that was with full brakes applied and reverse thrust. They ended up hitting that ravine right there, probably around 97 knots from what I read in the report. Um, all this could have been easily prevented if they had followed proper procedure. Uh, obviously starting with the checklist, you know, once they're rolling down the runway, 
Um, it's you know part of human nature. It's going to take us a lot longer to process what's going on and actually stop that aircraft um, because of you know everything that's involved. You know we're all human. We're not perfect. We're not going to be able to stop that aircraft once it's rolling. Uh, and in this case, they were not able to do it. There was a full 10 seconds um, where they could have acted but did not pull the throttles back and did not apply the brakes. So it's a, a pretty tragic accident um, as far as pilot error is concerned. And what would I do to prevent this in my flight department? Um, you know, we would establish an SMS and also a just culture environment. So, you know, if we had a pilot that wasn't using the checklist, you know, um, you know, would it be okay to report that error? Yes, it would. And there wouldn't be any repercussions from it. You know, we need to know about these things and encourage proper reporting. Is the problem with most of our uh, safety systems that we have now. Um, I would want my pilots, uh, you know, encourage accountability and redundancy in between them. You know, if, if one pilot's doing the, if the pilot in command's doing the pre-flight, I want the second in command. Um, going around and doing a pre-flight on the aircraft too, checking everything out. So we have redundancy. Um, two, eye, two sets of eyes are better than one. Um, also, they would be required to do mandatory training, um, you know, reoccurring training every so often, which these pilots did, um, but obviously it, it did not sink in for them. And that complacency and just being too comfortable with that aircraft got the best of them. And also another thing to touch on, too, is the ISBAO becomes certified with that um, because they have a lot of good procedures in place uh, for, for new flight departments looking to develop a um, SMS that, you know, things that we could go by and things that we could adopt, you know, tried and true procedures that already work well. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And that's it for week seven. We'll see you in week eight.